Well, good morning to Truth Baptist Church this morning. It is a blessing to be together. And uh, I am glad that we have many of you tuning in by way of live stream. And we have Nicole here. We have five faithful, hearty souls that came out. And, uh, well, Doug as well. He has a soul also. And uh, he's back there manning the booth and the, uh, the live stream. And, uh, but it's good to have a few here. And it's good to meet together by way of live stream. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I woke up this morning and saw nothing but wet rain outside. And I thought, oh, no. I, I thought for sure we'd have something. And sure enough, just about an hour, hour and a half ago, the white stuff started falling. It was sleet at first. And uh, it's interesting how this storm is. Everything is east to west. Usually you got the snow farther north, and then you have the rain, the sleet and the rain farther south. This is almost setting up the farther west you go, the more snow you have. And I live east of the church, and literally as Nicole and I were driving here, we could see it getting snowier and the roads having more accumulation on them just as we drove a few miles further west. And, uh, but anyway, it is another beautiful morning. The snow is falling outside. It is just a pretty winter day. And I'm glad that you're at home warm. I'm thankful for those who are here watching by way of live stream and uh, it is good to be together. And I'm going to ask Nicole to come back to the piano again and play one of those songs here for us. Just a moment, uh, she'll play an offertory and a special for us, kind of like she did uh, last Sunday. You can pick whatever song you want. And I'm really thankful for her. She's been a big help to, to me in these recent days. And first, it started with the virus. And we would make the trek out here on Sunday morning and Sunday night, and she'd be playing piano, and uh, now it's kind of continuing on with the weather. And so we've been kind of a ministry team here, Nicole and I, and I appreciate all her help and all that she's been doing, and Doug back there, and then just so many others. We ended up having a Saturday evening service uh, last night, and, uh, and it was a wonderful service. It really was a blessing. We had a good number of folks here that came out, and uh, I said last night, don't worry, we're not becoming Seventh-day Adventist or any other type of denomination. We are still Baptist, and we believe strongly that Sunday is the day that we worship the Lord. But I really am thankful now that we did have that service last night, just looking at how things are out there. And it's going to get really cold later today into the afternoon and the evening. So a lot of this slush might turn to a sheet of ice later. So if you are out and about, get it done quick. Get your, uh, your wings and your pizza, whatever you're having tonight, early, and uh, be careful out there because as, as it gets colder, everything will begin to firm up and freeze up, and so just be, be cautious in all that you're doing. Uh, I want to say, if you are watching by way of live stream, would you be so kind as to like or, or love or share this live feed and let us know that you're watching. Say good morning. Uh, I know many of you do. Let us know that you're here. Uh, there's always people watching uh, that we haven't met yet, or maybe we've not had the opportunity to know who you are. And if you're okay with doing so, let us know that you're watching. It's always neat to see who's watching us and where you're watching from. And I know on a day like today where it's snowing all, all across West Virginia and into Virginia, there'll be a lot of people that will be at home watching live stream services. So if you're joining with us, you're just visiting by way of watching the live stream, I want to encourage you, let us know who you are. Uh, we want to know uh, that you're watching, and we appreciate that. Uh, we can give by way of our website, which is truthbaptistchurch.com. If you'll just go to the home page and scroll down, you'll see a little link that says Secure Online Giving. It's a very secure site. Our website is secure, as well as the website that we utilize for giving, which is Vanco, and you can give that way and designate it as the Lord directs you. This time, speaking of offering, we're going to have Nicole play the offertory for us.
way again. If you have your Bibles, please, would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. have a couple more that have walked in here. Good to have you folks with us, Steve and Debbie. It's, it's no longer a secret, I guess, because you're going to see the back of their heads as they walk into the live stream here. So it's good to, good to see you all. So we have a few, a few that have ventured out, and I hope that you all are doing well. And I trust that you can hear me. Doug, can you hear me okay on my mic? And everyone can hear me on the live stream, and I'm sure you can hear me here. We're in Ephesians chapter 4. This morning we're going to continue in just a two-part series of messages. It's really almost one message that's been divided into two parts. Last night, if you were able to tune in or if you were here, uh, I preached about overcoming barriers to communication, and it's the first message. And in that first message, we looked at verses 22 through 24 of Ephesians chapter 4, and we saw in that message last night that if we're going to have right communication in our relationships, and especially as we apply it to the marriage relationship, we have to put some actions into place before we even begin, and these are actions that every believer needs to uh, practice, and we see in verse 22, the Bible says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So we are to put off that old nature. We are to put off the old man. We are to no longer live the way we once were. Sometimes you'll hear somebody say, uh, that was B.C. And when Christians say that, sometimes they're referring to their life before Christ. And maybe in their giving their testimony or talking about some of the things they used to do or places they would frequent or Whatever behaviors they were involved in, they would say, but that was B.C., before Christ, is, is what they're referring to. Because after we come to know Christ and he saved us, we become a new creature, the Bible says. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so in that regard, we are to be putting away the old man continually. Although we don't lose the old man until we leave this life, we are to be in the practice of putting the old man away mortifying the deeds of the flesh, as the Bible tells us. So we put off, but then secondly, we saw that we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Put off the old man, be renewed in your mind, and then third and finally, we are to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. If you missed it last night, that's a synopsis of what we learned. And now we launch right into the rest of the passage. We're in Ephesians chapter number 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 25, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. There the Bible says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers." And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So we're thinking about overcoming barriers to communication, part two. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help with this message. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together now. We pray that uh, you would be with those who are at home watching, be with those who are here, the few that came in person. Uh, I ask that this message would resonate with us. It is so vitally important that we understand how to communicate. And Lord, I just pray that you would grant us that understanding, and I pray that we would learn it from your word and apply the truths that we see and understand here. And Lord, I do ask that as we continue forward in our Christian experience, that we would become better communicators, 
that we would learn how to have right and proper communication with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with our neighbors, with our co-workers, Lord, especially with our spouses, with our children, with our families. We'll trust you in these things. We, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for communicating to us through your word. You are indeed the master communicator. So help us to learn from you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I began the message last night in the same way I'll begin the message this morning. Uh, I am still learning how to become a better communicator. I don't preach this message as any expert. Uh, I still have to go home to my wife and be her husband, and she'll keep me honest and let me know that I am not the best communicator in the world, although at one point in time I thought I probably was. Uh, life has a way of teaching us some things, doesn't it? And showing us that uh, we are not uh, as good at things that we think we are. And although I thought I could talk and speak and I was smooth and can get the message across and could communicate well, I have found now that there's a, a lot more that I have to learn. And there are times where I should communicate where I don't. There are times where I'm communicating, but perhaps I'm communicating in the wrong way. Or I'm saying something that's misinterpreted. Uh, or maybe someone didn't get the right, uh, the right message from what I was trying to get across. And, and, and all these things. And so I'm still a work in progress. Uh, I know that you are. The wonderful thing is we can continue to improve and God can help us to become the communicators that he wants us to become. Often difficulties and simple misunderstandings can be resolved with proper communication. Listen, we're imperfect and so miscommunication is going to happen. And as a result of miscommunication, there's going to be misunderstanding, there's going to be hurt feelings, uh, there's going to be uh, maybe some hard feelings that develop as a result of that. And we can resolve these things if we'll just determine to speak properly and come to a resolution in our communication. That's the key here. Yes, we'll mix things up and we'll goof things up and we won't say things right. The question is, how are you going to respond and move on from that? I find that many times the bigger problem is not in the miscommunication or in doing things the wrong way, but it's in letting it remain. Uh, we live in a culture and a day and age in which people uh, sometimes want to just sweep things under the rug as long as it, it benefits them. And sometimes in families, in homes, in churches, in relationships, rather than really dealing with things and coming to a resolution, people are willing just to let things sit. And maybe it gets buried down and it gets packed deep inside of us. And maybe it doesn't ever come back up and manifest itself, maybe for years, but then all of a sudden in a passionate discussion that might turn into more an argument, all those things come up. Why? Well, it might be that they weren't resolved or dealt with. And that can lead to some real difficulty in our relationships with people. So we need to ask the question, not only am I communicating properly, but am I just determining to resolve where there's conflict in communication and barriers that are there? Do you know that often this can be accomplished just through a simple face-to-face -face meeting and conversation. I know that we have all different types of communication these days. We have our cell phones and we have our pads and our pods and we have uh, our devices and every which way we can try to communicate. Uh, there's dozens of different social networks now that we can communicate to people with and I, I think fax, faxing is now a thing of the past. But there's scanning, and you don't even need scanning printers or machines now. You just take a picture of what you need to have sent, and it, it will send it in a PDF format. It just, there's, there's no shortage of ways for us to get information and communication across. And yet, it seems like miscommunication is a real problem today. And in spite of all the different methods and modes of communicating, one of the best ways is still face-to-face. -face. That's why I'm glad that we have a few people that have come today. I know most of our people couldn't, and I encouraged them not to, but some said, I'm going to be there, because really this is what church is about. It's about being together, 
And I'm looking forward to Wednesday night this week and next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll, we'll be avoiding snow next Sunday, Lord willing. I'm not predicting that, but I'm hoping that and we can all be back in person. I think we've learned in this previous year that being face to face is of high value and priority for us to be able to really communicate that way. The eyes uh, help us to really get a, an understanding of where a person is and uh, how they're thinking. And we need to be able to have that face-to-face -face communication. Uh, I'll often communicate in a, in a myriad of different ways with people. But I always like to sometimes just maybe meet with somebody in my office. If there's a real issue or a real problem that someone needs help with, I like to have an in-person meeting. I like to meet in my office or meet somewhere and grab a meal. Because really, you just don't get as much accomplished any other way. And the same is true in our relationship with our husband or our wife or our children. Think about this. When Moses went to meet with God to receive the Pentateuch, remember when he went up on Mount Sinai? The Bible says that he met with God face to face. And the Lord communicated not just in that way, but when it really came down to a very, very important part of communication, which was going to be his moral law, the Ten Commandments, and beyond that, the, the ceremonial law, and uh, all those books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Lord met with Moses face to face, and when he came off of Mount Sinai, the Bible says that he had the Shekinah glory of God shining forth from his face after having that face to face meeting. We need to never stop meeting and communicating in person, face to face. I would encourage husbands and wives who are watching this, uh, put down the devices for a while, put down whatever else has your attention and rid yourselves of the distractions and would you just look at each other eyeball to eyeball and speak to one another in a meaningful, heartfelt way. When I was in college and my wife and I were dating, we couldn't keep our eyes off of each other. You know, I loved looking at her right into her eyes, and she loved looking right into my eyes. We loved doing that. And, it's, and I mentioned this last night, but it's interesting how you go on years in marriage, and, and now you really have to focus and dedicate yourself to really looking at one another and communicating when there's things like children and pets and responsibilities, and uh, chores, and uh, so many things that come in and hinder what should be real communication. And I, I hope that the rest of this message helps us in overcoming these barriers that want to creep in. How can we do this? How can we overcome barriers to the communication that God wants us to have together as his people? Well, notice, first of all, we need, we need to just be honest. Let's start there. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. I've often said, and if you come to our church for any amount of time, that honesty isn't the best policy, it is the only policy. We must be honest with each other. And in the marriage relationship, if it's not built on honesty, that relationship is going to be mightily challenged. And it might really be prone to all types of different difficulties and maybe even destruction. Because a relationship that is healthy has to be built upon honesty. There cannot be lying. There cannot be dishonesty. Uh, I would encourage every couple to be totally and completely honest with one another. Now, if you're trying to hide an anniversary gift or you're planning something that's for their benefit... And I often say, maybe the Lord's okay with us fudging a bit to be able to just keep them from learning about a surprise, okay? I've preached this before, and some have said, well, I'm trying to hide this anniversary, uh, you know, surprise for my spouse. Now I have to tell them. I, well, I, didn't, I didn't mean that, you know? Sometimes we're keeping something from them for their benefit that they'll learn soon enough. I'm not speaking about those things, but I am talking about Real communication about everyday life issues, we have got to be honest. We've got to be an open book before our husbands and before our wives. We've got to be able to say completely what is in our heart and what is in our mind. 
Now, sometimes timing is important about how we say that and when we say those things. And we learn that as we go on in our relationships. Sometimes 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night isn't the best time to bring up a real deep, honest conversation. I've had to learn that the hard way over the years. Uh, sometimes I'm, my mind is firing on all cylinders at midnight. Uh, my wife doesn't operate very well at midnight, and we've learned that about one another. So you have to find a time where you're both able to focus, and you're both able to communicate well and, and, and choose those times. But we must be honest in our marriage relationships with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, I hope that Truth Baptist Church is defined by honest church members who are honest and open with one another and who are caring about one another to the point where we're willing to be a friend and to be honest. I would say we need to really work on developing closeness in relationships before we just try to be honest with people. Sometimes we can uh, be honest with someone that we've not really taken the time to build a relationship with and then it misfires and it doesn't have the intended effect like we had hoped that it would have. Sometimes, as a, even as a pastor, I've waited years to share things with people that I felt like I needed to share, but I wasn't able to share it yet because I, I hadn't developed the closeness in fellowship and relationship yet like I felt I needed to. So God help us to be honest. If we're dishonest, then we're starting from a a ruined foundation, and it will fall apart. And the Bible tells us very clearly, put away lying. Maybe we have been dishonest. Maybe we've lied in our relationship. Maybe we've told a number of lies. Maybe we're hiding things from our spouse and that they need to know or that they should know. I would say this, don't just keep it hidden. I would say the very best thing is to get it in the open and be honest about what they have not known or what you have not shared, or where you have told a direct lie to them, and confess it, and make it right with God, make it right with them, and then move forward in honesty. We need to be clearly open about our digital behavior. Our spouse needs to know what we watch, and what we see, and what comes across the screen on our phone, or on our computer, or on our tablet. They need to know those things. Uh, a husband or a wife should at any time be able to pick up the other's device and search for as long as they want. As a matter of fact, you know, Heather and I, we don't even have passcodes on our phones. You know, you can put a passcode on your phone. We just decided she's never going to have one on hers. I'm never going to have one on mine. And at any time she can pick my phone up, at any time I can pick hers up, and have free reign to look at every text message, at every website, at every bit of history that's been searched through on Google, and we keep those histories open so people can see, so they can see. Listen, we need to be completely open and completely honest with one, with one another. Husbands and wives, if you have a passcode on your phone that you're keeping your spouse from, you're not operating in what ought to be an open and honest environment. Now, I'm not saying that you're doing that to hide things from your spouse. Maybe you need a passcode on your phone. Then give the passcode to your spouse so that they can operate it and use it to get on. We have got to be honest with each other or else we're starting from a, a ruinous foundation that's built not on honesty but on dishonesty and it won't hold up. So that's one thought. I could say a lot more about that, but we have some other truth to get to this morning. Here's the second way that we can overcome barriers to communication, and that's this. Let no corrupt communication proceed out. Let's read further. I'm going to skip down to verse 29 where the Bible says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, the word corrupt here has the connotation of unwholesomeness or rottenness. The idea is that of rotting food or meat or smelly fish, okay? None of that is pleasant. Uh, maybe you're conjuring up some, 
some previous smells that you've had. It's, it's not a pleasant thought. It's certainly not a pleasant smell. And the Bible says, uh, if you are speaking and communicating in a corrupt way, that's what it's producing. Something that is rotten. Something that is corrupt. Something that is, is deteriorating. And it's not building up. It's breaking down. And so when we are communicating with corrupt words, we are intentionally being hurtful. Communicating with corrupt words means that we lash out, perhaps, in vocal anger. uh, Communicating with corrupt words is when we say something crude or something off-color. That would be corrupt communication. I will also say that corrupt communication will involve backbiting, gossiping. Being a tailbearer. Avoid gossip and avoid backbiting and, and avoid tailbearers like the plague. And maybe we ought to put them in their place as well so that they stop with their corrupt communication. See, Christians, sometimes we, we feel like we're good at a, maybe avoiding off color remarks or crude communication and, you know, what you might tell your children is potty mouth and so on. We might. We might fancy ourselves to be righteous people because we avoid those things, but then we'll go right around and and we'll talk about someone behind their back in a negative manner. Well, that's corrupt communication as well. How about this one? When we murmur, when we grumble, when we complain, (laughs) I'm guilty. Oh, it's just messy and terrible outside. Can you believe this? Two Sundays in a row, you know? No, I haven't said that yet. I haven't said that. I'm not going to tell you whether or not I've thought it, okay? But, but we can come to the place where we murmur, we grumble, we complain about everything, whether it's the weather or whether it's our job or whether it's our church or, uh, you know, whatever it might be. We just, we find ways to murmur, grumble, complain, Maybe it's about our physical issues, or maybe it's about the doctor that misdiagnosed or didn't give us the proper medicine, and all these different things we can find reasons to grumble about and complain about in our life. And the Bible says that all of this corrupt communication is rotten before God. Our command is this, do not let it proceed out of your mouth. Stop it before it proceeds. Maybe we need to bite our tongue. Maybe we need to think before we speak and cut off the communication in our mind before it comes out of our mouth. You know, some of the meanest, darkest statements, unfortunately, are spoken behind the walls and the closed doors of homes because we become familiar with each other. And we often know and understand that familiarity can breed contempt and where we might treat a total stranger with a lot more courtesy our own spouse or our children we might say some of the meanest darkest things to and yes we're familiar with one another we we feel a comfort within that relationship maybe even to strike out and say those things but it doesn't give us leeway to say it I was listening to David Tice recently, and he sometimes will counsel with couples. He's a pastor who's been out in Las Vegas for a long time. And he said sometimes a couple will come in, and the husband or wife will say about the other, last night she said that she hated me. She said that she hated me. And, uh, and they're acting as though everything is, is over now, you know. And then he said that he'll calmly look at, the wife or whoever it was that said it and say, and say, well, do you, do you hate him right now? And she'll say, no, no, I don't hate him now. But, you, but last night you said that you did. Yeah, but I felt like I did then, but I don't hate him now. You know, sometimes in the moments of passion and heated arguments, maybe even within the comfort of our own relationship, we feel like we can say those things. And I'm not suggesting that we do that, but one thing he has recognized in his years of counseling is this. At least there was a comfort level where they felt like they could tell you how they felt in the moment, okay? And maybe 
Even though that's honest communication, we need to stop ourselves from saying that in the moment. Because while we are to be honest, we also are to not let corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. Let's refrain from saying the hurtful, dark things before we say them. There's nothing okay or normal about it becoming just a normal part of our life in the home. It's corrupt. It's wrong to think it, but it becomes compounded when we release those thoughts in the spoken word. And so like I've said, think before you speak. Because once it's out, it's out. Once you've opened that jar and it's gotten out, it's out. Are you like me and have you ever sometimes said something and you wish you could take that right back? I mean, as soon as you said it. I've said something before and it's like I've wanted to grab the word and shove it right back in. But you can't do that with words. And the old, the old uh, statement that sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me is untrue. They hurt. And they might not break bones but they'll cut deep to the soul. They hurt bad. We have to realize that and say, no, I'm not going to let that out. I'm going to think twice and three and four and five times before I really say what I want to say in this moment. So be guarded and be wise and ask God for wisdom about what to say and when to say it. And especially don't let anything that's corrupt come out. God has to help us with that. Third, we need to build up rather than tear down. The second part of the verse says this, But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Remember that in our marriage relationships, as well as in all relationships, we must continually get back to verses 22 and 24. Putting off the old man and putting on the new. The old man wants to tear down. The old man wants to destroy. The old man wants to hurt and cut deep. But the new man has a different way of doing things. And the new man desires and wants to build up and wants to encourage. You can make a huge difference in your wife's demeanor, men, if you would choose to build her up rather than to break her down. And the same is true the other way. Wives, you will see a different husband in how he conducts himself and in how he goes about his business and maybe he'll become that spiritual leader that you want him to be in a great way if you would just build him up rather than nagging at him and nagging at him and making him feel like he's worthless and pulling him down all the time. Let's both determine that husbands and wives are going to build up with our words rather than to tear down. I can make all the difference in my wife's demeanor and how I communicate to her. If I'm not communicating in a positive way, it will have an effect. If I am communicating in a positive way, that will have an effect as well. And we need to strive with the help of God to do that. I brought up Pastor Shetler last night in my message about the seven steps to perfect dating. He also had another phrase that he would often remind all of us uh, ministry men in the ministerial seminar. He, he gave that ministerial seminar every Tuesday and Thursday, every week, and where he just spoke to the guys training for ministry. And when he would speak about marriage, he would say, men, just remember this, happy wife. And you know the rest. You can say it. Those who are watching at home can say it. Happy life. Happy wife. Happy life. Now that doesn't mean that we just say whatever she wants to hear, but it means in a real godly way, you're, you're striving to build her up and make her happy in the right way rather than to break her down. For a while, uh, in our kitchen on the windowsill above the sink, Heather would put some cotton balls, and on those cotton balls, she would, and I think maybe the kids made these as a craft, but she kept them there for a long time, cotton balls with those little sticky eyes on them, and maybe there was a piece of yarn for the mouth, it just looked like, you know, little fuzzy heads with two eyes and a little yarn mouth, something that a kid would make in a craft, and uh, for a long time she had those there, I think our dog even almost swallowed one and hacked it back up, and she still kind of fixed it up and put it back up there. 
And she called these the warm fuzzies. And she would talk about the warm fuzzies to Trent and Nicole, and especially to our younger two, Brooke and Johnny. And I, would, I, I told her, I said, why do you have those up there? She says, I want everyone to be reminded that we want to try to have warm fuzzies in this house. I said, what do you mean by warm fuzzies? I'm a dumb jock, as she tells me often. She says, you're just a dumb jock. So I ha I'm slow to learn these things. So in my dumb jock brain, I didn't get it. And she said, warm fuzzies, don't you understand? We want people to feel warm fuzzies. And, and we do that by building each other up, by using words of encouragement, by helping each other with our words, not hurting one another with our words. Good to the use of edifying. Now, this will not happen in our own power. We've got to live filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a matter of fact, the very next verse speaks about the Holy Spirit. Look at it with me. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So we, we learn about building up. Where does that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit within that builds us up. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, but don't get confused about the Holy Spirit because that's not the only thing he does. He also comforts us. He encourages us. He builds us up. He helps us to understand truth. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is a ministry of edification within our heart. And we are to take that same ministry that the Holy Spirit ministers to us and minister it out to others as well. That's why we see in verse 30 that the Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, or else we won't be able to communicate effectively as we are supposed to in the edification process, in the building up process. The problem with God's people is oftentimes we have grieved the Holy Spirit, and that's why we aren't communicating in an edifying manner. Now, we can't lose the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Once he comes and dwells in our heart, he remains with us for all of eternity. We can't ever lose the Holy Spirit of God. However, the Bible says we can grieve the Spirit. The Bible also says in another place that we can quench the Spirit. In other words, we can limit the effectiveness of his power in our life if we're allowing sin to reign in our bodies and if we're living after the flesh and giving priority to the flesh rather than to the spirit that spirit the holy spirit although he doesn't leave us he becomes grieved his power becomes quenched and so the bible reminds us if you're going to have this right proper communication then don't grieve the holy spirit of god if we would stop grieving the spirit i believe we'd communicate better i believe that we'd talk better I believe that we would be more effective as husbands and as wives if we would allow the Holy Spirit to have his place and if we would be filled with his power and we would give place to him. You know what it is? It's simply this, yieldedness. Yieldedness to the Spirit rather than to the flesh. Now we see yield signs all around as we drive and we are supposed to obey those signs, okay? Okay? Not to coast through them, maybe give a glance and speed and try to get in front of the person before they get there. That's not what yieldedness means. Yielding means you see the yield sign, you see if anyone's even close, and if they're coming, you stop so that they can go. That's what we are to do with the Spirit of God. It's not my way or the highway. It's not what I want. It's not feeding the flesh and choosing my path. It's, Lord, I, I'm going to yield to the Spirit. Spirit of God, you take control. You show me where we're going, and I'm going to yield to you, and I'm going to follow you. If you'll do that, you will, I believe, see your communication improve, your marriage relationship improve, and all relationships improve. Just don't grieve the Spirit of God. And if you have, acknowledge that before God and ask for the fullness of His power into your life again. Confess sin. Make it right. And that Holy Spirit will begin to be, be flourishing in your life again whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Even in this message, we're reminded and assured that with the Spirit we are sealed. 
He says, don't you grieve the spirit. Uh, the human mind might read that and say that now, now the next thing he's going to say, don't grieve the spirit or he'll zap you. Don't grieve the spirit or he'll chop your head off. Don't grieve the spirit or he'll damn your soul. But he doesn't say any of those things. He says, grieve not the spirit of God. And now we see the heart of our God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't you love the heart of God? You see, he says, don't grieve the spirit of God because he's with you forever. And he seals you. He's the one keeping you saved. He's the one who is keeping your soul. Uh, he is the one who's sealing you in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one sealing you until the day of redemption. You're sealed by the Spirit. You can't lose that seal, so don't grieve it. Allow the Spirit to have His place. You see, our communication relationship with others, it all stems from this yieldedness. I'm going to turn to James chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. And in James chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, the Bible says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue of men are members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, that it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. If we didn't have an idea of what the tongue is and what it can do, those verses help us to understand. Our tongue can bring great damage. It's a small little member. Oh, but I'll tell you the damage it can do. And if we were just to take a, a gander at our society right now, I think we see damage everywhere because of the tongue. And, and it, there are many people that are guilty. I'm not speaking about one person. I think many people right now in positions of government, in positions of authority, in pop culture, you name it, damage is on every side because of what people are saying. And maybe you didn't say it, but you posted it. It's just like you said it. Watch what you post and watch what you say. And Yes, I know we have freedom of speech. I get it. I'm glad that we have freedom of speech. That doesn't mean you should say everything that first comes to your mind. Be wise. May God help us to understand the implication of our words and the damage that they can do. Freedom of speech is a great blessing. I believe it's a blessing that comes from God. But remember that tongue. The, the thing that can control it the most is the Spirit of God. Not some law, not something else. And that's why we need the Spirit of God to have His place so that we can control what we say through His power, through His help. Here's another thought in our passage, and that's let it go. <laughs> If you have girls in the home and you know anything about the Disney princesses, and uh, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about those, but we all know let it go, and we all know that Elsa saying about letting it go. We are also to let go of some things. The Bible tells us in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. There are some things that we are to let go. And they're listed right here in this verse. You see, uh, we have to get rid of these types of communication or else we're not going to be involved in right communication. Bitterness often leads to hurtful words. And if we're holding on to something inside, if, if we're not releasing somebody, we're going to eventually say something that we regret. Wrath. Uh, that would speak, of course, to passionate anger and anger. Notice this word, in clamor. What is clamor? It's literally defined as this, an outcry. And the Bible says that we need to do away with outcries. Now, we live right now in a culture that is continually outcrying about everything. I'm outraged, and therefore, I'm going to let an outcry. And people are, are loudly 
crying out about what's wrong with everything. And I'm not saying there's not a time or place to stand for truth and to speak out. Oh, but the outcry of our day sometimes is not warranted. And the Lord tells us that we need to take clamor and put it away. Don't be the person who's so quick to outcry about everything. Trust God. Leave it with Him. He can deal with it much better than we can. And then finally, I'll end with this thought in verse 32. Exercise KFC. You might say, exercise KFC. Now, right away, that doesn't sound like those two things go together. Exercise and KFC. Pastor, you, that's an oxymoron right there within and of itself, and you're right. But I'm not talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken. We need to put into practice and exercise KFC as it is represented in verse 32. I got this from an evangelist who visited us, uh, us years ago, and he preached on this verse, and he had a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket that he put up there. There was no chicken in it, so all of us Baptists weren't too happy about that. But he had a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket, and he used those words KFC to illustrate his points about the verse. Kindness, forgiveness, and then C being compassion. And if we are ever going to overcome barriers to communication, this must be a regular part of our communication in our marriages, in our homes, in our church, at work, in every aspect of life. Exercise KFC. That is, first of all, and be ye kind one to another. Kindness simply means usefulness here in our verse. You know, it doesn't cost you much just to be kind. Just to give a smile and give a kind word. I'm not for false flattery. But you can certainly find something to say that's kind to somebody. You can find something about someone uh, that is positive and that is an encouragement. And you can be kind to them by mentioning that. I hope that our church is defined by a spirit of kindness, and I believe it is. I really believe it is. I hear time and time again people say, you know, everyone's just so friendly at truth. They're just so kind. May that always be a hallmark of this church. I'm glad for that because people see truth Baptist, and that might scare people initially. Truth, oh boy, what is this place all about? And then I want them to walk in and just be showered and overwhelmed with kindness. Because if we're going to be people of the truth, we must be people who are kind one to another. That's what the truth is all about. That's speaking the truth in love. And so would you determine just to be useful by being kind to those around you? No one wants to walk into a home or into a relationship where there's a lot of unkindness and hurtfulness. No one wants to walk into a church where someone doesn't speak to them or barely look at them and maybe makes them feel unwelcome. That's not exercising kindness one to another. We are to be useful in our words and useful in our treatment of other people. And I believe the kindest person that ever lived was the Lord Jesus as you study his life and his ministry, what shines through Jesus' life over and over and over again is just his kindness, his gentleness, the way he interacted with all people, young people, old people, healthy people, sick people, men, women, all different cultures, all different nationalities, Jews, Samaritans, whoever it was, he was kind to everybody. That's what a Christian does. That's the spirit of Christ, being kind to everyone. And don't just be kind to the people that you don't see very often where it's easy to be kind. Be kind to those who are closest to you. Would you just be kind to your spouse? Just determine to be kind to that wonderful person God's given to you. Be kind to your Children, be kind to your parents. 
Uh, in our home, uh, we have dinner usually about three times a week. We have a family dinner. We can't do it every night because there's games, there's practices, but we try maybe twice, sometimes three times a week to be able to all sit down together at the dinner table. And uh, we, we have to remind the children, hey, be kind. Be kind. We have different age brackets. We have two teenagers and we have two elementary age ones. And sometimes those teenagers can, you know, feel like they know everything and they can look at the little elementary school ones and just be a little unkind. And we have to say, hey, hey be kind. Be kind to them. Remember what you were like when you were that age. Remember the things that you said. And we'll bring those right up, and that usually quiets things down a little bit. <laughs> but we have to remind them to be kind. My wife and I need to practice being kind to each other. And if kindness begins in the home, it will work itself out outside of the home. But it even begins earlier than that. It has to begin in your own heart. To know that God and what he's done for you has changed everything about you. And therefore, you're going to exercise kindness in your relationships. The Bible then goes on to say, uh, tender-hearted. The word tender-hearted here means well-compassioned or sympathetic. And it leads us to doing what is sometimes hard, forgiving one another. Kindness is always preceded by forgiveness. If we are kind people, we will be a forgiving people. We need to strive to be forgiving, offer forgiveness, be quick to forgive. Uh, listen, we would not be who we are today. We would not even exist today if it wasn't for the forgiveness of God. If, if the Lord had an unforgiving heart when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, that would be it. They would be eliminated. It would all be done. You talk about the jig being up, that would be it. It's over, it's done. The Lord would have said, I made a terrible mistake. Man's eliminated. Eliminate creation. I'll go back to the way it was before. I was just fine before. Aren't you thankful that the Lord didn't do that? In his kindness, he offered forgiveness, and he offered a sacrifice for Adam and Eve's sin. And from that time till now, he has offered a sacrifice for all of our sin in his kindness and in his forgiveness of us. The Lord has forgiven us if we'll just receive his free gift because he's a compassionate God. You see, we are to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And, and here's, here's the key to it all. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We have offended God by our sin. Our sin is offensive to God. God never had to create man. He never had to create this world. He did not have to, but in his love, he did. He created us, and man still turned from God, and man sinned. And because of that, we begin dead in our trespasses and sins. But we don't have to end that way because of the kindness and forgiveness of the Lord. The Bible says that He has forgiven us for Christ's sake as we look to Him and confess our sin before Him and call upon Him for salvation. The Bible tells us very clearly in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, man, confession is made known unto salvation. With the heart, man believeth, but with the mouth, man confesses. That's what we need to do. Believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. If we're going to be like Christ in our communication, if we're going to be like the Lord, if we're going to exercise true kindness and tender-heartedness, and compassion, we have to get back to where we started with all of this, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. You see, if Christ is exemplified, and we strive to become like Him, 
we'll be well on our way to overcoming the barriers to communication. It's being like Christ that helps us to do all of it. Being like Christ helps us to be honest. Being like Christ keeps us from communicating in a corrupt manner. It's being like Christ that builds people up rather than tears them down. Being like Christ helps us to let go of the fleshly desires and the fleshly reactions that we sometimes want to engage in. Being like Christ is what ultimately will cause us to be kind and forgiving and compassionate because that's what he's offered to us. I've needed a lot of kindness. I've needed a lot of forgiveness. I've needed a lot of compassion. And woe to me if I don't offer it as well. I stand here as a man that must give it because I have received of it so much kindness and forgiveness and compassion from my God, from my wife, from my children, from my church, from many others. God's been so good to me. And if you're watching this and you know the Lord, you can say He has been so good to me as well. Maybe you don't know the Lord. Would you just call upon Him like I preached about? Acknowledge your sin before Him, confess it, and believe on the Lord Jesus as God. And call upon Him to save you. He will. And you can live that kindness and that forgiveness and that compassion and you'll become like him. Would you, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Even if you're, you're at home, would you just do that now for a moment? Maybe you don't know the Lord, but you want to call upon him to be saved. It's very easy. You admit that you're a sinner. You believe on Jesus Christ as God and that he went to the cross and shed his blood and died for you and that he rose from the dead three days later. If you believe that and are willing to trust that and receive the Lord and what he's done, call upon him now. Simply say right there where you are, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm calling upon you to save me. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus is God and that he died and rose from the dead. And that he can save me. Come into my life, Lord. Help me to live for you. And if you're there and you've said that prayer, would you mind sending us an email? You can send it to pastor at truthbaptistchurch.com. Maybe you'd even like to mention it on the live feed. I don't know. But we as a church want to help you to grow in this relationship with Christ. Let me ask everybody, how is your communication? Especially in that number one human relationship that you have, the one with your spouse. It can become a wonderful thing. Maybe it already is, but maybe there's some areas that were mentioned here that need a little work, maybe just a little maintenance. I'm not saying you have a bad relationship. I'm not saying you have bad communication, but maybe there's a point or two here where you say, you know, maybe I haven't uh, let go of some of the fleshly responses. Maybe I have hid just a few things and I've not been totally honest. Maybe there is some corruption that's proceeding out. I, I just I want to bring this before the Lord and ask him to help me. Those who are here and those who are watching, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer now and ask him for his help in these things. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving your life for us and, Lord, purchasing our redemption. Often, one of the biggest hindrances in marriage and in all relationships is communication. The lack of proper communication as the Lord would have us to have it. Lord, I, I want it. I want to communicate properly. And I pray that we would apply these things, that you would help us to be able to do so. I, I pray that we remember to put off the old man and be renewed daily in our mind and put on the new man and Lord, help us to put these actions into practice that we see spelled out for us right here in this passage. This is your truth. It's your word. We need you to help us with it. So, Lord, I ask that we would 
begin to live by these things, and then that we would move forward in, in right and proper communication with one another, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we'll trust you to lead us as we go. I pray that we wouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't want to give place to anger or clamor. or Lord, we, we don't want to react in the flesh. We want to be led by the Spirit. So I pray that we wouldn't grieve the Spirit. But Lord, help us to be filled with the power of the Spirit of God. We'll trust you to help us with that. Thank you now for your love for us. Give us a great rest of this day. Thank you for these who've braved the weather to come out and those, Lord, who are at home watching so many online. We look to you now and ask you for your grace and for your strength to move forward as you'd have us to. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for watching and thank you for being here. We'll let everyone get home as quickly as they can. God bless and have a wonderful day. We'll see you on Wednesday.